Uh, so, how many people here work directly on the hill? Great. How many people work at a tangential angle to the hill? Slight angle. Okay, great. How many people are far afield, far away from the hill? You guys do gaming, mobile design, or you're professional baseball players. That's what I'm guessing. Uh, that's exactly that. Oh, good guess. So uh, this morning we heard a bunch about kind of a legislative angle from members of Congress about how Congress works and how it doesn't. I think there's actually a book entitled How Congress Works and How It Doesn't, which I read not too long ago. Uh, but now we get to talk about some of the fun stuff, which is a world that I touch and a world that both of our panelists here touch, which is funding organizations and companies that are meant to help Congress in a meaningful way. So has anyone here ever dreamt of fixing or modernizing Congress in any meaningful way? Yeah, come on. Nightmares are okay. You can raise your hand for that, too. Good. Nightmares. So if you do that, and if you ever get serious about one of those ideas, both of these panelists are people that you want to talk to. In fact, there's probably some of the first and hopefully the last calls that you'd make to either fund your project or meet people who are working on that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk a bunch today about how we fund projects to help Congress, both in the civic tech space and the gov tech space. Those are two separate things, by the way. Civic tech is more focused on individuals interacting with their government. Gov tech is more how technology helps government operate itself, which is a key distinction. Uh, so we're going to talk about everyone's background, so everyone has an understanding of who they are. But, uh, and then we'll get into a bunch of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. We'd love it to be as interactive as possible. So start thinking of really good questions now, uh, and we'll make sure that we get to those. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So Betsy, would you like to give us a little bit of your background? Sure. Can everybody hear me? I haven't yes. spent a lot of time with a microphone in my hand. Um, because for 26 years, I was a congressional staffer, and so um, was not the person with the microphone. Um, so this is a little bit new to me. Um, but I was a chief of staff on the Hill for 26 years, and I will, I will plead guilty to the fact that I was one of the foot draggers. Um, I'm sure that Congressman Moulton and Congressman Hurd were talking about. It was never a priority for me. And my friends on the House Administration Committee, who have been so committed to this issue for so long, um, that I'm now working so hard to help. Um, as Chris discussed on, uh, in terms of our strategy that we developed after we developed that systems map, which I definitely have had nightmares about. By the way, it was horrifying yeah, and amazing it's at a the same time. It's, it's, a it's a nightmare. It was yeah. a nightmare. But anyway, um, you know, they laugh out loud to see me now prioritizing these issues because I, I did not prioritize them. Um, I will tell you, though, to whoever it was that asked the question, how can we help Congress change? Um, and prioritize these issues. Um, I go back to how did we, how did I in my own office uh, prioritize get prioritized to have a good website? And the answer was peer pressure. Um, Congressman Hurd absolutely identified that answer correctly, but I want to put a finer point on it. Members want to be loved. They want the shiniest toy possible, and if their friend has it and they don't, they want to have it right away. And so when my longtime boss did not receive a Golden Mouse Award, the first year they were awarded, he came back and he said, I want a mouse. And we got one the next year because we prioritized that, because his friends had one and he didn't. So um, don't underestimate the value of peer pressure, particularly when dealing with members of Congress, and don't underestimate the value of their own desire to be loved. So this is a question of rewards and incentives. Yeah, peer pressure, drugs, and uh, technological innovation in Congress. Ava? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ava. I, am, I work at the Knight Foundation on the technology innovation team. Um, and so, you know, we're at $2.5 billion, we have a $2.5 billion endowment, um, and one of our main focus areas is civic technology. Um, I think, as you all know, Congress is historic, has historically low approval ratings, I think as of May. No. <laughs> as of May, Gallup uh, shows that I think only 74% uh, 74 of Americans disapprove. Um, and so we want to help fix that. We want to help address the, the issues that um, we see all around us. Um, and so our, our team is specifically focused on modernizing government, improving the election process, um, and improving civ civic activism. Awesome. Thank you very much. So a uh, bit of intro on me. So my name is Alex. Hello. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm chief product officer at a company called Countable, which is a civic tech application which helps people reach out to their government and learn about what their government is doing. Before that, I was at a company called Brigade, which was Sean Parker's civic tech startup. And before that, I founded another civic tech startup of my own called Indigov. So I've been in this space for a while and very familiar with your organizations. And I think it was uh, a, a huge goal of mine at some point to get a meeting with Betsy. So sitting on a panel now a couple years later is, is quite exciting for me. 
I'm going to try and keep it together. I'm grateful so, to be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to talk about first is kind of a, a statement that you hear said a lot, but I don't think is very well understood. People say these kind of things. They look at Gallup polls, and they're like, oh, God, Congress is broken. Things are not working. But in your opinion, is Congress broken? Does it need huge solutions like that? Or is it a slow process and we're moving in that direction? How do you feel about the current state of the institution? Do you want to start? Um, you know, I, I really, as a longtime staffer, you know, I don't think Congress is broken. I think Congress is full of a lot of really good people who come to Washington to, and they want to make the world a better place. And how they define that is, you know, may vary. But generally, they're good people who want to do the right thing. I think there are a lot of forces that Chris talked about it that make it hard for them to do that and pull them apart. Um, but I think you saw here an example, and there are many other examples like that on other issues of members working together across the aisle, particularly among the newer members who have just had it and are not willing to accept the status quo. I think the challenge becomes, again, as I mentioned, what are the incentives, what are the rewards? I think that um, an important point was made by Congressman Moulton when he said um, that we won basically the Cold War because we were willing to compete in science with the Soviets. And so it's a question of kind of getting out of quadrant one, what's urgent, which is where members operate most of the time, and incentivizing them to get into quadrant two, which is what is important and more long term. I think we're making progress in that area. I think it's too slow. I think we're trying to work together and and build build collective impact to sort of move the process along. But And I think they know they need help. So no, they're not broken. They know they need help. Yeah, I like that. It's one of those things where you have to assess whether or not it's requisite complexity or non-requisite complexity. Startup guy from the Bay, I think everything should be disrupted and burned to the ground and rebuilt. It's just in my DNA. But the truth is, when you work closer with members of Congress, you realize that's not the case, that some things are meant to go slowly. Some things like legislation are meant to be very thoughtful uh, and kind of slow. Uh, so as that question, you mentioned something before. You mentioned the notion of urgency. I mean, for both of you, what do you think Congress needs most urgently? In terms of the projects that you're funding or things that you're looking to fund, what do you think would be the first thing you would solve? Um, I mean, I think from my perspective, it's there's really a lack of, um, you know, I think in our personal lives, we're all using digital tools on a regular basis. Um, and there's really a lack of, like, digital accessibility for Congress. I feel like there's no way for citizens to actively engage with their Congress members, hear back from them, um, and it's leading to like a real disconnect. I think a lot of people feel that their voices aren't being heard. Um, and so I would love to, to bridge that gap um, and make Congress a little more responsive to um, their constituents um, Yeah, and the need of the communities that they serve. That's great. If I could just add to that, I think I think the responsiveness is a very important piece. I also think um, helping members rebuild the tools for outreach that have atrophied over the last number of years. I mean, Chris talks a little bit about the redder and redder, redder and redder and bluer and bluer districts, and I think one of the one of the consequences of that is that members who are in safe district um, have felt less impetus to actively reach out into their constituencies. And, um, and listen, you know, not just respond, but actively seek and listen yeah. to the voices of their constituents. And so there's this sense of lack of relevance um, and lack of, um, yeah, lack of relevance to, of Congress to their own lives. I think it's a complicated answer. Yeah. Um, I think it's not just tech, frankly. Um, there have to be more opportunities for members to know each other better. Um, they. They create some of those opportunities themselves, but some don't, and we can provide more of those opportunities. I think we have to help the institution be more efficient so that it makes a better product, because I think that um, more resources can be spent once the public believes that the product is better. People are generally willing to pay money for a better product, but they're not willing to pay money for schlock. Right. And then and then it's part of it is changing who comes into the institution, because the kind of candidate you are informs the kind of member of Congress you'll be. If you run on a platform of tearing down the institution, sure. you have a mandate once you're here to tear down the institution, right. and that needs to change. And I guess I would just tag on to that. Like, I would love to see a more open and public input process around policy decisions. I think we have the technology now to do that. Um, and I think there's just a lot of interest um, in the communities for um, to have their voices heard. So there's enormous opportunity here, I think. 
Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you. So one of the questions I have is, so Congress in many ways is a very different type of institution than a commercial entity, but in many ways it's actually very similar. So if I'm Coca-Cola and I'm selling Cokes all over the world, and there's a certain percentage of Cokes that have rat tails in them or like fingers or something like that, Coca-Cola has to have a very well-developed customer service arm to be able to respond to thousands of people who are reaching in every day and saying, hey, I found like you know, an entire iPhone in my Coke, thanks a lot. Um, so in a situation like that, a company has had to learn how to create tools to manage communication from tens of thousands of people a day. Congress has all those tools available. And there's no reason why a marketing automation platform or a customer management tool like an Olark or a Zendesk or something like that wouldn't be useful for that case, but those types of tools don't make it into Congress. Now, there's some reasons why that's the case. In some cases, you want higher level of security so that those tools wouldn't meet those standards, and that's an important thing. But why hasn't the private market infiltrated Congress more? What's stopping them from getting in the door? Well, I think there are technical standards that the, that the Congress sets that make that very difficult. Um, and I, I also think that um, there have been some inroads. And what happened over time was that there was one large company that was buying up each of those startups as they would make some That's contractor. inroads. Right. Yeah. Um, that's no longer the case. Um, and, and that company actually has been spun off. So I think, you know, when you think in terms of disruption, there is an opportunity mm -hmm. at this point. And I think the institution is beginning to realize it and um, has prioritized investment, for example, at the Library of Congress. So I think there is slow, um, there's, there's some slow progress. And there are also some staff who have been laboring, and I'm looking at one of them for years, to really prioritize this work and who see this opportunity. And what we're trying to do at Democracy Fund is um, make sure that folks know that they've got support and an ally in us. Because I think one thing that I try to bring to this work that I say and advice to all of y'all, um, Try to find a way to do things for Congress and with Congress, not to Congress, right? Um, it has enough self-hate to go around, right? And it's looking for allies. And to the extent that you can be a trusted partner um, instead of an opponent that's issuing press releases and wagging your finger, that will make you more effective in achieving your goals. Even though those are very fun things to do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I guess looking beyond just Congress, I think a lot of our grantees struggle with the procurement process. I mean, it's a very long sales cycle, um, and these are like very lean nonprofits in many cases. Um, and so that's hard for them. That's really hard for them to, um, to secure those contracts. Um, and in addition to that, I think, you know, one of the problems in the civic tech space personally is that there's a lack of a clear customer. Um, I think in many cases, a lot of nonprofits that we fund, you know, the, we're the customer, essentially. The foundations are the customer. The beneficiaries are the public. Um, but there's no clear customer beyond foundations who would pay for this tool. Um, so I think the most successful civic technology companies are ones that, um, you know, have identified a service that government needs and a repeatable, reliable source of revenue from government for that service. Oh, that's great. And if I could just add one other perspective, there are 500, and th well, including the delegates, 541 different offices, right? Each of them does that job differently. And so creating a mandate among the members, the, the, institute, the management of the institution responds to the member mandate. It's awfully hard to create that mandate when there are 541 different ways of doing the job. And they all want to do their own thing. And they're all their own, they're each is their own little island. So that, combined with the complicated contract process, makes it very difficult to sort of say, you know, for Congress, members of Congress, enough members of Congress to say, I need this thing and right. get it through the procurement process quickly enough where the market hasn't already eclipsed it. Right, absolutely. So I want to switch gears for a second and talk about investment thesis. So. Accountable, we recently closed a round of $2 million from Canaan Partners, say, Sand Hill Road VC. But I can tell you that's a very positive end result of an incredibly painful and long road that I was on with the company raising money for almost a year. And I went and talked to, and I've raised rounds of capital for multiple startups before. Civic tech is a very, very unique challenge to get investors to understand. I would sit there in front of partners that I work with at Sequoia Capital or other big na brand name VCs and be like, this is going to change the world. There's a big need for this. People are using this, so, so forth. And they always say VCs are like penguins. They're like sitting on the side of like an iceberg waiting for another penguin to jump in and not get eaten before they want to jump in. 
So Civic Tap suffers from the penguin problem, so to speak, from a VC perspective. So as you're kind of thinking about how you invest in the space, what's your investment thesis? What do you think makes sense? Why do you allocate capital? Um, well, I would say, I mean, we're very different from VCs in that we're looking at a double bottom line. I think VCs are looking for... Two penguins. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, VCs are looking for ideas that will scale quickly um, and, and will generate, you know, large returns. And I think for foundation funders, um, these are grants, so they don't have to be repaid. Um, and we're looking for um, civic technology organizations that are having real measurable social impact. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they haven't figured out the business model yet, you know? And so, and so that's something that we really need to, um, that we're working with our grantees on, is figuring out sustainability models beyond foundations. So how can you um, earn revenue that, you know, feeds back into the organization and makes you more sustainable over the long run? Right. And for us, um, I would say, scalability, impact, particularly the ability to build collective impact, the ability that we, we try to use our, the funds we have to um, bring various folks together who are working on similar problems and incentivize them to work together. And so to the extent that a grantee can do that, that that's important to us. Um, and then whenever possible, to identify grantees um, who are working on both sides of the aisle. Um, particularly, you know, there's a pretty well-established um, cohort left of center, um, you know, we're very, we think part of the way to help Congress work better is to be working with partners who are right of center as well and then create those partnerships to work on both sides of the aisle. Right, totally. Yeah, so one of the things, so I can't exactly figure out why, but Countable, since we got founded, we've sent 10 million or so messages to Congress. Since the election, we sent an additional 3 million. So that's like, Oh, a couple months versus we've been around for like years. So we had this like massive hockey stick growth and we still can't figure out exactly why that happened. But there seems to be a renewed sense of interest in politics in the US for sure. And what I see now is, and I've been in civic tech for a while, I get people reaching out to me every week saying like, hey, I have a new idea for a civic tech company, let's talk about it. So there are people all over the country and quite frankly all over the world because it's not just happening in America, political volatility is happening across the world that are coming up with new weird ideas for political you know, ways to make the political system operate more effectively, ways to engage more people in the political system. And you all are getting probably a significant chunk of the deal flow of people saying, I need money, I'm looking to fund this project. What things have you heard in the past couple months that have been really interesting or that you get excited about? Um, so I would say, I mean, a lot, Knight Foundation just recently um, granted $3 million to Democracy Works and um, CTCL, the Center for Technology and Civic Life. Uh, and that's an organization that's working to modernize local election offices. Um, and Democracy Works is working on uh, increasing voter participation in the United States. Um, so we're, so you know, I think there's a lot, uh, we, we've seen an uptick in applications around um, voting and elections. Um, and also citizen engagement tools, that's another area where we're seeing <laughs> an uptick uh, cool. in proposals that we're now begging. Nice. And, and those are also some of our grantees, and so, and you know, we, we work together, particularly in the election space, um, with a number of those grantees. I think for, for us, in the governance program, um, two things. One is um, what we're calling loosely political entrepreneurs, folks who are willing to try different models um, of both campaigning and, um, and, and reaching new audiences who've clearly expressed their disdain for the system but may not have identified the perfect solution right. yet to fixing the system that they've got a problem with. Um, so so those, those two things I think are, are yeah. particularly exciting for us. And I also want to give a shout out to two night grantees who are here at the conference today. We have a uh, tech congress, Travis Moore, he's um, right there. <laughs> And yeah, um, so you know he's working on um, sending tech fellows into Congress to help um, build the skills around technology legislation um, that, that's so needed, um, and also um, Open Gov Foundation. We're in the process of working with Democracy Fund on a grant to them as well. Yeah, that's great. 
And also, I just would like to say, Congressional Management Foundation, which has been around for a long time, but really has been, Kathy Goldschmidt in the back room, uh, is, is really w working hard and was the founder of the Gold Mouse. I mean, they, they were kind of on the vanguard of this 20 years ago, God help us. The other, the other I think, sort of unheralded potential ally um, is the new librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, who is just, you know, kick ass. I mean, we will all be working for her eventually. And she, in less than a year, has created a mandate for, you know, and successfully won a pretty significant uptick in funding for IT at the library. Awesome. And I think that's a great sign of hope. Great. Well, I want to give the audience uh, an opportunity to ask any questions. Uh, so who here has a civic tech project or GovTech project looking to fund or questions? Yeah. Uh, this is a question. Uh, no project to fund just yet. Uh, no matter yet. My name is Maurice Turner, uh, Tech Congress Congressional Innovation Fellow, so thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Um, my question goes back to sort of the nuts and bolts of congressional modernization. Uh, I've been in Congress for a couple of months, and uh, one of the basic things I've noticed is that um, I'm having trouble just finding email addresses uh, for my colleagues on the House side. Uh, so it leads me to believe that there are more of those sort of small problems that can make a really big impact if they're solved. So how do we get to those nuts and bolts issues that can make Congress actually work as Congress as opposed to House and the Senate who happen to be sitting across the street from one another? So just really quickly, first name dot last name at mail.house.gov. And there is a global directory somewhere. But it was always very difficult to find. And I had to hunt and peck a lot. And in the Senate, it's first name underscore last name at the senator's name dot Senate dot gov. Almost always. So that's the first formula. Try please that until, before you go to the directory. Please wait until after the panel to write emails to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but um, in terms of what are the impediments? I mean, is that really what you're? How do we get to the really basic problems um, that can really be the foundation for modernization. It shouldn't be so difficult to find an email address. The back office stuff. Yeah. Exactly. I, the I, things I, that are so similar, it really even though we act like the organizations are so different and unique. The institution responds to the member demand. So when the CAO office, when the CAO feels enough pressure from enough members, like Mr. Hurd, and, and, and I mean, you know, it's, I don't mean to identify, the CAO is doing their best on a lot of fronts to deal with a lot of issues. So it's not a criticism. but. In the same way that members' constituents create the mandate and drive how the members behave, the institution responds to the mandate that it gets from its members. So when there are enough tech fellows who are asking that question of their boss and their boss thinks it's important enough to go to the floor and have the conversation with, uh, with their colleagues and then they go to leadership, that's when the change will happen. So it's, it's a slow process. You know, it's a slow process. Um, Maybe we need a congressional digital service. It's crazy we, talk. Yeah, I know, yeah. we do. Hi, Josh Bilgmeyer from Fireside 21. Um, this is a question for Betsy. What, what percentage of the problem and solution do you think is actually technology versus policy? For instance, um, within offices and how members look at things. As technologists, we think if we just have the right technology, we can solve this. Um, for example, one of the challenges is um, member offices kind of have this model of thinking where a constituent sends me a message and I send them a reply. And there's kind of a disruption with Countable where now we're trying to get more aggregate opinions together, but you know, members don't, they're scared of that. Um, so I'm curious what you think, you know, how can we, well, how can a lot we of times they don't even see that mail, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times they don't even see that mail. Um, how can you influence members to... I mean, is that a tech problem or is that an office? Problem? I think it's both. I think it's both. I think that if, well, this is maybe more of a philosophical answer than you're going to, than you're, than you want, but this is, this is what I think. I think that members have, have been conditioned over the last 15 years to not do outreach. I think they went into their shells after 9-11. I think the shooting of Congresswoman Giffords actually also really affected how they conducted outreach. And then I think safer districts also didn't force them to. Um, but I would also say, you know, Congressman Cantor, when he lost his primary, lost because he had a constituency that he didn't know. It was a very safe district, but it was a new district, and it was a constituency that he didn't know very well, and that created an opportunity. So 
when I look at town hall meetings, for example, in February, and saw on CNN the chairman of one of the state parties yelling, I looked, I, I knew the member who was conducting the meeting, and I looked at where he was, and he wasn't up on a stage behind a podium with a PowerPoint. He was walking among his constituents, creating a conversation and managing the conversation. He happens to be a member who's been around, I think, 10 years, but his father was in Congress before that. So he has this really just almost internal DNA about, about listening to your constituents. So when campaign consultants said to him, you know, what kind of idiot is holding town meetings right now? The answer is somebody who knows that he's got to keep doing outreach in order to keep his constituency engaged and really to understand the people that he seeks to represent. And I think, it, so I think it's both. I, th I think part of the solution is tech, but I also think part of the solution, again, changing the incentives and rewards and helping and giving members the, the resources, um, both in terms of trainings um, and in terms of models that are easy for these much smaller staffs, much lower paid staff than they were 10 years ago, to, to easily utilize um, and, and just help them get back out there. I mean, I know that sounds, it's, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. To add a layer of kind of resolution on top of that, the way that I look at this is there's a level of cultural acceptance of, com of considering a technological solution for things and then being able to integrate and use that technology. The technology itself does not solve the problem. It's a tool, and you have to want to use the tool. And I think we're getting to a point now where members of Congress are having younger and younger staff, and they're, well, I guess the staffs have always been super young, but they're having a higher and higher fluency with technology. That change is happening, but on average, Congress tends to lag behind the private market I'm being charitable, maybe when I say this, three to four years. So we're getting there. We're getting there. 20. 20. Okay, good. At least I didn't say it. <laughs> well, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. And Gary, yeah, let's thank our panel for a great conversation.